All right, good morning, everyone. My name's John Krill. Uh, the ping pong story is false, fake news media. Don't believe him. Uh, just kidding. Uh, this is Ethan, our awesome student. And there's three things you have to know about me. Before we get started, there's three things you need to know. The first thing is that I'm a triplet. I'm a triplet. Basically means I'm a third of a person. It's not even that cool, right? My birthday, I have to divide my cake into thirds. Like, it's terrible, actually, right? Uh, and I have superpowers. It's all good stuff. The second thing you have to know is I'm a professional, actually a professional, blueberry picker. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. I've been picking blueberries since I was six years old. I got trigger thumbs. I can pick an 11-pound bucket in 5.5 minutes. Not that impressive, I know. And the third thing, the only thing you really need to know is that I, I, uh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus, and that's why I'm here today. And our wonderful student, Ethan, uh, there's a lot of cool things about him, too. He's a, he's a black belt, essentially Eagle Scout or Hawk Scout, or I don't know what he is, and he's wearing sandals on stage. So that's where we're at. And Ethan is going to pray for us today and get us started. All right, everybody, you can bow your heads with me. God... Thank you for just knowing that uh, we are, love you. And as we come out of this time of celebrating your son's birth, uh, just remind us that this celebration and this joy keeps going even past the time of Christmas. Thank you for this snow and thank you for technically a white Christmas. <laughs> and I pray for safety for all of the people who may be stuck in the snow or don't have a way to get around as easily. Mm -hmm. I thank you for celebrating, and I thank you for family, mm -hmm. and uh, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Ethan, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Sandals, though. Why sandals? All right, so some of you guys might be wondering, uh, why am I here, right? I mean, how desperate did they get? Okay, a couple of months ago, uh, Steve came to my office, and he said, hey, John, do you, have any, do you have any good messages? I'm like, Steve, I got, I got five. He's like, all right, can you give one after Christmas? I said, sure. Now, I told him I have five because if today goes really well, he might invite me back four more times. But let's be honest, I stole today's message. I don't have any messages. Uh, so that's where we're at. And you might also be wondering, uh, where has Steve been? Okay, he's always in Kansas on flat earth. I mean, what is he possibly doing over there, right? So I have a contact in Kansas. I said, hey, if you... Uh, if you see Steve Hill, can you send me a picture of him? And he said, sure. So in the baseball game, he found Steve Hill. Ladies and gentlemen, your senior pastor. Uh, I did not know that side of him existed, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, once you see it, cannot be unseen. Uh, so that's where we're at. Uh, Steve, I love you. Don't worry. So today's main point today is, is a topic that's not easy to talk about. It's actually a difficult topic that takes uh, a lot of work. But I think if we do this our lives might be really different. And we're talking about warped worship, warped worship. So what is warped worship? Now worship, the word worship, means ascribing worth to. So when you go to a concert of a singer, let's just say a random singer, Taylor Swift maybe, right? When you go there, you're ascribing worth to sing to her. You put value, you put energy, you put your affection, and you're singing songs. Just like a job, right? Just like your family, whatever that could be for you, you ascribe worth to it, and that's why you worship. Now, we're talking about warped worship because warped is bent, is distorted, it's not normal, it's angled at something else. And what I'm more specifically talking about is idol worship. Idol worship. Now, idols is a good thing that we turn into a God thing. So something that's good, family, job, Taco Bell, Taylor Swift, I mean, whatever it is, vocation, uh, vacations, right? Those are good things. But when we turn them into God things, that's when we get in trouble. And I need to tell you a story about my very first, probably biggest idol in my life, which happened to be in the fifth grade. So in the fifth grade, I'm driving around with my family. And since I have three sisters, two of them are triplet sisters, uh, we would always go to each other's houses or friends' houses to drop off or pick up. And there's this one girl's house we're going to uh, six blocks away from my house. Uh, her name's Haley. Uh, my mom and dad don't know this. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. And uh, Haley, I had a huge crush on Haley. Okay, let's just be honest, guys. I had a huge crush. Okay, she is brunette. Uh, she played soccer. Would probably change her name to Taylor Swift. I mean, just all, everything I needed in a girlfriend, right? And she was leaving just like all my other imaginary girlfriends. And I was going to her house because she was giving a present away to my sisters as a going away gift. 
And so I get there, and my sisters have these huge packages in front of them, and they're opening it up in front of me. And sure enough, the gift inside was none other than a Barbie dollhouse 2000. Ladies and gentlemen, look at that. A bar- that that's like advanced in years, okay? It was a decade above its time. Double decker, decals in the kitchen. I mean, that thing, I just was picturing my army men there. I realized, guys, I, I, didn't, I didn't want it. I, I needed it, okay? Like, I had to have it. So the next month after my sisters got that, I was like looking over the shoulders. I'm like, hey, can I... Can I play with that? No, John, you can't play with it. But just just for a little bit. No, no, John. And so at the end of a month, um, I asked my mom, hey, mom, do you you love me? She said, yeah, John, I love you. I asked her two more times, do you love me? She said, yeah, John. I'm like, if you love me, can you buy me a Barbie dollhouse 2000? No, John. (laughs) So she never bought me this gift, but I was just so enamored it, so, so focused in on it that nothing mattered. I played club soccer and other things going on, but this thing became an idol in my life and nothing seemed to matter. And the question today is, maybe some of us have a Barbie dollhouse 2000 in our life. Now I don't mean literally, I mean maybe there is an idol that looks something different, maybe it is that, I don't know, now you see it. Uh, But maybe what is that in your life? So we're gonna talk about a story that many of you guys know in Exodus 32 about the golden calf. So if you have your Bibles or if you're online sitting on your couch, Ronan or Elijah, uh, open up your Bibles and turn to Exodus 32. A little context before we get there. Uh, God appointed this man named Moses to to go there to to lead the people out of Egypt. Okay, they were in slavery. They were uh, by Pharaoh and the people were stuck, but Moses uh, was connected with God and Moses uh, pleaded with God and they caused plagues. There was gnats, there was the river turning to blood, there was the first born child and God did all these miracles to rescue the people out of Egypt. Now God led them to the Red Sea and God parted the sea, they walked through it, and then God killed the Israelites. I mean, all the people following them, right? I mean, all the Pharaoh's army. And then God also provided manna in the wilderness. And obviously manna was obviously Twinkies and Taco Bell, right? I mean, obviously that was God's manna. But we have to understand, the second point today, is that God was on the throne of their hearts. After all that, after all the miracles, everything God did to this point, they trusted God, they worshiped God, they sacrificed idols to God. God was on the altar. That's what they worshiped. And everything starts to change after this monumental scene in Exodus 32. Now we have to set the scene up. Uh, God kind of stops his people and he says, at Mount, Mount Sinai, he says, Moses, I need to meet with you on top of this mountain. Uh, when I talk to you, the people will hear me, and it's gonna be this monumental event to know that I am the Lord, your God, the only God. So I want you guys just to hear this, this picture of what the people see to set up Exodus 32. On the third day, when Moses is meeting with God on the mountain, there were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud on a mountain, a very loud trumpet blast. So all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like a smoke of kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpets grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called to Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Now, this picture here is this, there's this mountaintop with thunder, lightning, trumpets, just this crazy scene, and in the next couple verses, he says, hey, make a boundary so people don't go up there. If they do, they're, they're going to die, because I'm a holy God. I'm just talking to you. So it's this huge scene, and the people are trembling. The people hear God, and this is, what, this is the scene of Exodus 32 when we get there. Now, the first thing God tells Moses is the Ten Commandments, which many of you guys are familiar with in Exodus 20. But God spoke all these things in words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above or that is on earth beneath or the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous 
God. He's saying, hey, the first thing I want you guys to do is not to put a uh, God before me. And it's more specifically, don't, don't carve an image, right? Do not do that. Now, the people of the Bible, uh, this is written with intelligence. God knew what was going to happen. He said, hey, just a reminder, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Uh, don't make an idol or put anything before me. And he actually goes on in detail about this after the Ten Commandments. The first thing God goes in detail about is idols. In verse 20, 23, or chapter 20, verse 23, he, shall, he said, You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourself gods of gold. Again, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. And Moses went up and down the mountain eight times telling the Israelites what to do. Now, if that's the first thing you heard, hey, the one thing you need to know, Israelites, from God, is don't make a god, and especially out of gold, uh, you would think the people would grasp it. You would think the people would understand, okay, yeah, I should not do that. But when we turn to Exodus 32, uh, the author does something different. He, he switches scenes. God is giving commands to Moses, and all of a sudden, in this, in this chapter, uh, there's a scene switch, and we see what the people are doing on the ground below. So Exodus 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves up to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. And as this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we did not know what's become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hands and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now this is a strange scene because most scholars and theologians believe that Moses only stayed up on the mountain three more days roughly than usual. He was up and down eight times and he, he was gone for a little longer and the people are getting antsy. The people aren't trusting God, the people aren't being patient for God, and the people are saying, yeah, you know what, uh, Aaron, do you have anything for us to do? We're kind of bored here, do you have, do you have another God? Uh, Aaron's like, uh, what should we do? He's like, hey, do you guys have any gold? How about, we, how about we put all the gold together in the fire and we make a, we make a calf? What, what if we do all of our possessions, our money, our time? What if, we, what if we did that? And the people were like, yeah, great idea, right? Let's just pull it all together. All of our possessions sounds good. Now, this is absurd because that's the first thing God told them not to do, but they quickly turn away. So the author goes back into to God's point of view with Moses, and God has to relay this information to Moses. In verse 7, the Lord says to Moses, Go down, for your people whom brought you out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way I have commanded them, and they have made for themselves a golden calf, and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it. These are your gods, or is, and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, how they are stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and that I might consume them, in order that I make you a great nation. Now, I don't know how God says this. He says, hey, you know your people who follow me through all those plagues, through, through the, dry, you know, the Red Sea, and I parted it, and through all the golden manna. They've seen me. They worship me. I was on the altar, but they have turned aside quickly. Man, I, I, they're actually worshiping and dancing around a golden calf. And just how strange is that? And Moses is probably going, are you kidding me, right? S-M-H, as the youth says, right? I mean, they're just shocked. He's like, uh, really? And so Moses pleads on the, on the people's behalf so God doesn't kill them, and God listens. But now Moses is about to go down the mountain to see what's happened. Verse 15, Moses turned and went down from the mountain with two tablets of the testimony in hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and the back, and they were written. 
The tablets were the work of God, and the writings was the writings of God engraved on the tablets. Now, you have to understand, the author is going into detail there for a reason. Hey, put it put in your mind, why is he going into detail about these tablets? It's the first time ever that God's written on, like, in form on a tablet before, and he's making note of it to think about. So verse 17, when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he says, it's not the sound of shouting for victory, or the sound of cry for defeat, but the sound of singing I hear, kind of like Whoville. And as soon as he, he was near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it up to powder and scattered it in the water and made the people of Israel drink it. Talk about consequences, right? Talk about interesting Starbucks drink. I mean, but Moses is so angry and so mad, he threw the writings of God. Just think about that. If, if you had the most valuable possession, God of the universe's writings in your hand, uh, he threw it away because of their idol worship. That's how important it was to God and Moses. Hey, he, they turned away from the Lord. Nothing else matters. Who cares about possessions? Who cares about whatever you have? I mean, these people need to go back to God. And so he, he burns down the idol and corrects them. Now it begs the question, what does that have to do with us today? Well, just as Moses was gone for a little while, um, as we know, Jesus has also been gone for a little while, maybe a little longer than a, a little while. And the question today is, if he came back, just like Moses came back, what is he going to see us worshiping? Is it going to be something as silly as the golden calf? Or is it going to be the Lord your God? What will it be? Now, you have to ponder that, and you have to understand that we, too, may have idols. I have to come to grips with myself that I might have an idol. And the easiest way to assess this is this quote I love by Louis Giglio. Uh, this quote says, it's easy if you want to find out if you have an idol. You simply follow the trail of your time, your affection, your energy, your money, and your allegiance. At the end of that trail, you'll find a throne. And whatever or whoever is on that throne is what's of highest value to you. And on that throne is what you worship. It's really easy. If you just follow these five things, your time, affection, money, money uh, energy, and allegiance, you follow those things, track them in your life, what's the common denominator? What do you spend the most time on? Now, this looks differently for different people, even for me. For some people, this might be family. Right? When you see a new couple have kids, it seems kids is everything, right? There's selfies, blog posts, I mean, birthdays, there's just, there's just energy, time, affection, and just, it's all about kids, which again is a good thing. We just might have turned it to a God thing. Maybe it's your career. You, you, love, to, you love your job and you, just, you work overtime, you just climb up, climb the corporate ladder to make more money. It's all about your status, it's all about your pride, whatever it is, and maybe that's your vice. Maybe that's your golden calf. It could be other things. It could be uh, hobbies you do or uh, Twinkies or Taylor Swift, like me, unfortunately. But, uh, but one thing, one striking thing that's in our society that is the golden calf of our age um, has to deal with the story in Corvallis. When I was in Corvallis, I would frequently go to uh, Varsity and Antioch, which are Christian houses, which I love. I mean, they're fraternities, but not really, right? They drink root beer. And uh, at these houses, there would be a chapel service. So I remember one time, I was in chapel. We were, we were praising God. We were listening to a sermon. And I looked around, and people weren't too excited. People weren't raising hands or energetic. And uh, when chapel was over, we turned on the soccer game. It was the Timbers championship game, not this latest one, but the one we actually won a few years, well, actually plenty of years back now. And I'll tell you guys, when the game was over, when we won, the same hundred people in chapel were completely different. I mean, these people went nuts. They're screaming, they're yelling, they're chest bumping, they're drinking root beer again, right? I mean, they're, they're just losing it. And I'm thinking, man, what's, what's wrong with this picture? 
I remember leaving with a student that, that goes there. I'm saying, man, why, why when we worship God, the living God, the God who made the little ball called Earth we're spinning on, like that guy, which we can talk to, how come there's no like energy or affection or passion there? But we get to the sport, people just kick a ball on some grass and people lose their minds. They just go crazy. I'm like, man, what's, what's wrong there? And I'm saying that for me too, man, how come I am drawn into that crowd also? And I think there's a real struggle with you and me about idol worship, and I think sports is huge. I mean, you just go to Austin Stadium, right? There's thousands and thousands of people cheering, chanting. Uh, they spend their time, their energy, their money, their focus. I mean, they'll, they'll be there six hours, right? Pre-gaming, post-gaming. If you're Christian, you leave out the pre-gaming, but don't tell people, right? I mean, it, it just, you spend all day there, and you love sports. But if someone asked us, including me, if we're willing to go two hours to a prayer meeting, uh, man, would I do that? I hope so, but it's just interesting what we spend our time on. And now I love my students to death, I love them. But uh, man, the sports culture and the teenagers, man, they spend 20 hours a week in sports sometimes. 20 hours, a part-time job, and it's normal. It's normal, it's, it's, it's duh. Of course we're gonna spend two hours every single day plus tournaments, plus driving, playing sports. But when I say, hey, let's spend 20 hours reading the Bible, fasting, praying, serving the orphan and widow, ah, we don't have time for that. That's, 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 that's not on my priority list. Why, why is that? How, how come our culture is so different? And so I, th I think it's because we have that golden calf. And so I struggle with it, maybe you guys do too. But one thing we have to understand is God's response to us when we worship idols. God's response is one of grace, of love. There's a reason two chapters after the golden calf, God tells his character that he's slow to anger, abounding in grace and compassion. God says that after these events. And in Jeremiah 2, God has these words for us. When people, when Israel left God, this is, this is God talking. He says, hey, I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and you followed me into a land, a land not sown. And this is God talking, okay? This is, we always think he's a God just judging, just telling us things. This is him as a loving father. He said, hey, man, I remember when you used to follow me. You used to love me like a bride. And uh, man, I really just want you back. And he goes on and he says, man, what, what wrong did I did that your fathers left me? What did I do to hurt you, to, to make you go away to those things? He says, you guys have committed two sins against me. You've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and you hewed out your own cisterns, cisterns that can't hold water. He's saying, man, you guys left the spring of living water, God, everything, he's eternal life, he just gives you hope here and now, and you, you left me for, for those things, for cisterns that can't hold water, things that won't give us life, you left me for that? Now, God's heart is more angry that, or more, more sad that you left him, but you, and you left him for those things. And as a loving father, he said, hey, I, I want you back. I want you, I want you to remember my, your first love. Remember, the, as, as the Israelites were given a commandment, we too have our first commandment, right? Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, strength, mind. Man, is that on our hearts? Is that the first thing we do? I hope so. I hope so, but here's the hope, here's the dream, here's what happens when we do worship God. When God is on the altar of our life, he shows off. He shows off, and it's amazing. Uh, we just kind of finished our, our Give campaign with a lot of organizations, uh, HIV Alliance, Angel Tree, Snowflakes of Joy, the Valley West Healthcare Center, uh, Will Gillespie Elementary School, and we gave 200 gifts away. Praise God, right? That's amazing, right? You guys use your time, your money, your affection uh, just to serve them. That's amazing. But also in the student ministry, just seeing uh, God just lifted up on high in students' lives, uh, we started Rack, Raina Max of Kindness, where two students, uh, Ronan and Jay, hopefully you're watching, uh, they uh, lead a group of students out underneath the bridge, and we go serve people in need. We, we, we fed uh, over 70 people with food, have conversations. We also provided uh, uh, medical supplies for them and, and some warm clothing. Um, students uh, were examples and taught, us, taught me what it's like to put God on the altar. Okay, okay, they worship him. 
okay, that they're using their whole Sunday afternoon just to serve people. That's amazing, right? We also had a student leadership retreat recently. Uh, it was a lovely uh, church friends of ours let us stay at their cabin on the beach. And when we were there, uh, we spent about seven hours doing Bible study. Seven hours for teenagers. That is a miracle, right? But just thinking about that, I mean, how many people do that on a regular basis? So praise God for that. Also, this year, uh, for the students, we did a Christmas gift challenge. I said, hey, possessions are kind of like an idol. What if we gave up a gift or two or all your gifts this year just to donate it to this organization called Destiny Rescue, where they save people who are being trafficked, who, who are slaves? What, what if we did that? And students said, you're right. And so they gave up their money, they gave up gifts, and we pulled in all the money between high school and middle school, and we raised, I think it's like $2,500. And we, we, we funded a, almost two full rescues that could possibly save 40 kids from being trafficked, all because God was on the throne of their lives. That is amazing. That is amazing. And I want, as we continue uh, with, with almost the new year upon us, what would our lives look if we worshiped him with everything? What if he was on the throne in our lives? What would God do through you? And I hope you think about that. I hope you ponder that as we continue to worship him in song and that we realize that he is, he loves you and that we need to get rid of our golden calves so we can just glorify him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for you. We thank you that you are loving, that you show grace and mercy, that you're a father who adores us, but you just, you're jealous, God. You, you want us back. And so many of us may have got trapped up in these civilian affairs. God, would you just lead us back to you? Help us just turn away from those things and turn to a God who loves us, who adores us, and who wants the best for us in this life. So we praise you and we lift you on high. In your name I pray, amen.